All right, in this video, I'm gonna to talk to you about everything you need to know to export a car to another country, or if you wanna keep it in the same country, but you know you wanna ship it very long distance, let's say Montreal to Vancouver, I'm gonna cover everything. How to prepare for it, the import, the export, what you can do and not, and all the things that I have actually suffered. I actually imported and exported my car, well, basically eight times, so that's basically eight export and eight import. So let's talk about all the issues I've ever faced and see how that works. All right, let's begin with this. Preparation. So the first thing you need to do, okay, prepare the car. Uh, I would say washer fluid. Sounds ridiculous, but if you're from Jamaica and you actually go to Canada with your car, you're gonna burst your hoses because in Jamaica they use water with soap and in Canada we have to use anti-freeze, like really like minus 45 liquid because otherwise it's gonna freeze the system and you're gonna just squirt that in your window and it's gonna freeze instantly as you drive if the temperature is minus 30, right? The second thing is gas. Now, this varies. A lot of companies, a lot of countries, okay, shippers will say, well, first of all, never have your tank full because of the fact that the temperature inside the container gets very high. So don't put your tank full. Um, I ran out of gas once because they told me to have no gas in the tank virtually, and they actually ran out of gas because they kept the car running for the gamma ray for a long time with ACA and then whatever, two hours of running for nothing, and I ran out of gas. That was in Jamaica also. Uh, so that. Um, so I say half tank. Normally that's what I have. Okay, about 200 kilometers worth of driving, more than enough. Gasoline also could be another issue for export. A lot of countries will not allow diesel cars. So you have to make sure that if you have a car that the engine has, let's say diesel or something else that is not recognized where you're going, you're gonna have to check that out. The third issue in this, it's not really a, a requirement, but it's a problem, okay? If you have a high performance car, like I have a BMW X3 M series, so basically it's very powerful engine, it's basically like a Mercedes uh, AMG, for example, you may have issues with the gasoline. In a lot of countries, they have only 90 octane, uh, so you have to put octane boosters in your gas, otherwise your engine's gonna buck uh, and you're gonna lose a lot of performance, okay? So when you bring your car to another country, please take that under consideration. I always have these little red bottles that I fill the car with. Uh, so I fill my car and I just put the bottle in, it goes for two, three refill, and it keeps the engine running without, you know, issues. All right, so to export your car out of your country, First of all, you cannot export a car that you don't own, okay? So even if the car is under your name, if your title say that you still own money to let's say whatever, you, the lender or the dealer or whatever, you will not be able to export your car. If you have tickets, you will not be able to export your car. The minute they're gonna investigate everything and realize that the car has a lien on it or that you don't own it fully, you didn't pay everything on it, you won't be able to export. You can only export a car that's fully 100% paid with no debt, no ticket, clean, clean, clean. All right, there are two ways to export a car. Generally, okay, I use a container because I have my household goods, so I have a 45 footer, I have a full video on how to export your household goods, so check it out, it has everything in it completely. So I normally have half the container, or let's say, uh, well, yeah, almost like 40% of the container in my car and 60% my household goods, and that's how I export. Their other way is row, row, roll on, roll off. You can do that normally with new cars. With used cars, it's not as useful because uh, you would have to have a port that actually has a boat coming and a, you know, a boat landing off on the other side. It's not really easy. Uh, most of the time you ship in containers, either a 40 or a 20, 20 for most cars. Okay, there are three ways to bring a car inside a container. Okay, normally I always, end up in developing nation and I use mostly towings, but the most popular or the best way in most places should be technically a loading dock. So you bring the container flat with the loading dock and you drive your car inside. That's the best way to do it, least risky. The second one, sounds scary, can't do that with a Ferrari, is ramps, okay? So essentially it's very steep, uh, they lean just on the side of the container, but they're very strong, don't worry. Uh, they will be able to accommodate your vehicle and you can drive your car inside. Um, it's a bit scary, but it works. The third one is the one I use the most, a towing. So you're gonna load your car on a flatbed, you're gonna back out the flatbed to the container and you're gonna drive it out or drive it in. Okay, this is the most popular way I use because towings are available everywhere. Now. Should you go frontward or backward? In my case, it, with my BMW, I have uh, the front cameras that also has arrows in order to be able to, and features that allow you to drive over pits, okay? So basically it aligns the car automatically. 
if you don't have that, back your car in. Because don't forget your sensors won't work. The minute you get in, all your sensors are gonna start beeping because you're too close to everything. You more than likely, just to give you an idea, will have to get out by your window because there's not enough space on the left and the right, okay? You're literally gonna have 10 centimeters left, 10 centimeters right. Here, I strongly recommend that you remove all accessories before you load the car into the container, okay? So essentially the racking on the roof, uh, a hitch, anything that people can easily steal because it might stay in the port for a long time, okay? So you don't want that. Also, because it takes space when you're inside a container, you might want to use that space to put something else if ever you're shipping your goods as well. Now, if you're shipping your household goods at the same time that you're shipping your car, I strongly recommend that you put as much as possible in the car when you get that destination, you take the car out, you take everything from the car, you put that in the container because your container can leave immediately. So you'll have your household good very quick. I have a full video on how to do that here and leave the car there. That's the simplest way, gain more space and normally people don't have a problem with it. Now, I always take class A insurance because of the fact that, uh, you know, if you have any damage, the damage is going to be big on the car. And I already had damage before, okay? So that's not an issue. I always take the photos of everything before I leave. So inside and out, okay, I take pictures or I take a video. And if I have any damages, like last time I just did on my BMW, uh, when they remove the divider, it's something fell. Uh, it's okay, things happen. They know it's their fault, but it's easy to prove that if there's a dispute, if you have pictures before and after. Now, the most important part, and you may not be allowed to do it because it's so important. The lashing of the car inside the container. Now, there's multiple ways of doing it, but you have to do two things normally, okay? So you're gonna put the wood, you're gonna either drill the wood at the bottom of the container, there's a plywood at the bottom, or you're gonna be able to nail it down. And then after that, you're gonna attach strap to the hooks on the side of the container. You have to do both, okay? Because if the container end up like at a 45 degree angle, trust me, your handbrake will not be able to hold the car. And it happened to me in the Philippines, okay? What happened is that they didn't have a picker like to bring the container flat. They only had uh, a crane. So the container was about at a 30, 40 degree angle and you could hear all the furniture and everything like, you know, go cracking around and like, you know, I really thought that the car is gonna get out of the container right through my furniture, okay? So that's a bit scary. Luckily, the car was attached very solid and it didn't move. So you have to make sure. Insurance also may not allow you to do that. But anyway, you, the people that load your car should be able to do it. All right, now you've loaded your car, you're ready to go. You're gonna close your door, you're gonna install the seal yourself, you're gonna take a picture of it. I wanna make sure that you have that number. When you arrive at destination, if you're there, okay, I want you to check if the seal is the exact same, okay, to make sure that nobody opened your container. Very important. Also, a seal number may be requested by the you know, paperwork, whatever, in the BL or something. You make sure you have those and you have a photo to prove it. All right, so now your container arrived, you're super excited, you're gonna have your car soon. Well, maybe not. All right, let me explain to you why. Okay, now we're talking about importation. I cannot talk to you too much about the taxes. I've never had to deal with it because as a diplomat, my container is always under the diplomatic program. I never pay taxes. However, all the rest I dealt with and I suffered from. All right, tainted windows. The last move I've done with my BMW, they forced me to remove the tainted windows in the front. Stupidly, diplomats are not obligated to, but sometimes people at the port don't understand the rule. And after a month and a half of fighting, I had to make a decision. Either I continue paying for the port every day or I make a sacrifice and give away my uh, tainted windows and next move I'll put them back on. Also, the month and a half is because of one mechanical issue. And this is a very important one that you may face yourself depending on the car you have. Guys, if you're a car mechanic, I want you to comment and explain that to me, please, okay? Because BMW is a pain, but I don't know if other cars are the same. All right, let me explain this. You need two things to bring your car in. You're gonna need your engine serial number, which is virtually impossible to find, okay? And I had all the trouble in the world and you cannot just do that on a BMW in a pit like this guy is trying. It didn't work, okay? And basically it cost me a month-ish at the port before they allowed me to bring the car to BMW for BMW to find it. You need a special probe. Uh, it's underneath the manifold. Don't ask me why they hide that stupid number. I know it has to do with TEF or something or international car trafficking nonsense, but for importing and exporting, it's a total pain. Even if you know your engine serial number, they want to see it. And the problem is I was caught in a catch-22. They don't want me to take the car out because it's not cleared, but they don't 
they're not able to find the engine serial number unless they let me take the car out, okay? We fought for a month and a half. It was a completely stupid, anyway. Let, let's not go into that. But this is something you may face. The second one is your chassis number. No issues. You open your hood, it's right there. Check through your windshield, it's on the dash. Very easy number. Anybody can see that in two seconds. Everybody know that one. But the engine, the engine serial number, big issue. All right, the other two problems you might face is your battery, okay? My battery die a lot. Again, if you're a mechanic, explain. Uh, it just cost me uh, 1400 bucks like a year ago to replace it. It's a new car. The problem is, is because the car stayed in the container for about two months. They had the port for another two months. So eight, you know, like apparently a four or five months inside a container, uh, batteries don't survive those. Uh, I still managed to start my car, surprisingly enough. It's just the battery discharge a lot and they told me I had to change it. Okay. The second problem is your tire pressure. Tire might be completely flat which is the case in the last move that I did, and I just show that now. Uh, so I don't care, I have run flat tires, I just drove the car out with the flat tires, and I went to the next gas station, I filled them up, and I went them, you know, I brought them to BMW, and they fixed it up. There was no flat, no issues, it just did deflate, okay, because of the heat, I guess. So that's it, so these are the problems you might face. Now, at the parallel, you need your three other things to take your car out of the port. You need your license plate, you need your insurance, whether it's decorative or not, because in a lot of countries, the insurance don't pay even if you have a crash, so it's decorative, and you need your registration. You need to do this in parallel, okay? Because otherwise, it might take you two to three weeks to do it, while taking two to three weeks to export your, your car. So if you do that in parallel, you're good. In a lot of countries, okay, again, developing nation, Philippines, one example, it took me a year and a half to get my license plate. Not joking, actually, I left the country, I still didn't have the license plate. I only had little decorative things that I made myself in words said diplomatic for registration. Cops didn't care, they stop you, diplomatic ID, F off, that's it, fine. But if you don't, then you may have that kind of situation where plating your car might take you a long time. Um, so I don't know, maybe you won't even be able to drive your car for a while until you get your license plate. That happened in a lot of countries, okay? So you have to be careful. Other countries, it's a joke, it's super fast. So you're gonna have to deal with that. The last problem you may have, okay? And you're gonna have it when you export, import, you're gonna have it following you for the next move is the language. So if you move, let's say for example, in Lebanon, sounds ridiculous, people speak French and English, but the government's only operated in Arabic. All the document I got was in Arabic. So what do you think happened here? When I moved to the US afterward, I needed to translate all this in English. So I needed to go to the embassy with somebody they recommend, a uh, professional, whatever, a certified translator, and translate in English before I arrive in the US, okay? So this is kind of issues that you can deal with. You may have to go with an agent just to get your license plate and insurance because it might be in a language you don't speak. It's the same thing in China, Vietnam, other places like this, and people may not speak English. So overall, guys, that's how you import and export a car. I hope that was not too lengthy, but I tried to put everything that I know in there because trust me, you don't wanna have to go through all those nightmares if you can avoid them, okay? Sometimes you may just forget something Thing and it might doom your entire project, right? You might lose your car. Don't do, you know, like, don't do that. Make sure you have an agent, make sure you understand everything, all right? I actually lost a scooter because we had imported the scooter and the car, and they say only one vehicle was allowed, and it took me a year to take the scooter out of the port, and by the time I, they, they told me, yes, you can take it out, the fees was more than a scooter, we left it there. Yeah. So I basically lost the scooter. So guys, make sure you know before you go, all right? So take care, subscribe to the channel, give me a thumbs up, and I'll talk to you next time.